so as we move on to the uh, first inaugural session today redefining leadership in the era of globalization strengthening technological intervention inclusivity and sustainability in education so for that i would like to invite professor abhilasha singh ma'am if you could please uh, take your seat vice president academic affairs on the american university in the emirates dubai who is the moderator for the session today ERBS Yadav founder chancellor IES University Bhopal India Jyotishman Datta managing trustee Assam Downtown University Assam Assam India and Mr Dennis Gosne managing director and founder Rasmitas Theater Schools Our inaugural session today redefining leadership in the era of globalization strengthening technological intervention inclusivity and sustainability in education uh thank you very much and uh, uh very good morning to one and all uh assalam alaikum uh i we need some uh, little warmth actually i can see that everyone is very calm and quiet and it looks like a typical educational event so uh thank you very much once again and thank you dr gupta for your inspiring words it's uh, once again my pleasure to welcome you all to the inaugural panel discussion on redefining leadership in the era of globalization the topic is strengthening technological intervention inclusivity and sustainability in uh, in uh, education and this is organized under the umbrella of 25th elets world education summit which is i have been attending this event and i can proudly say that it is the most influential and premier global uh, platform to explore the future of education i am certain you will agree all of you sitting here that the traditional model of education is no longer efficient is no longer effective uh, especially when it comes to leadership because the current educational landscape the entire ecosystem is changing and dr gupta has mentioned about ai and uh, chat gpt which is yes sometime it is threatening as well to all the educators here it's not easy to bring the movers and shakers of the world the educationist in one room if we go deep we can say that yes we proudly we can say we create the future when we say that the ecosystem of education is changing we can also see that the leadership is taking a new meaning and it requires the leaders sitting here to adapt to redefine to innovate to revisit their leadership style and especially in three key areas which we are going to discuss today which is tech intervention and most of the institutions are doing that but we will hear some of the best practices inclusivity which is dei initiative diversity equity and uh, uh uh the inclusivity and of course sustainability which is a key word here and we need to strengthen uh these three areas in higher education and in of course school education as well the more we navigate into the complexities of the 21st century we have to redefine leadership and today we have eminent panelist here it is unfortunate that mr ishtiaq is not able to join who was the founder member and chairman of the board of trustees but we are joined by bs yadav the chancellor of top ies university bhopal please give him a round of applause here <laughs> mr datta uh, jyotish man datta who is the managing trustee assam downtown university please give him a round of applause thank you uh navin goel is also not able to join his uh, the flights are delayed but we are uh, ha having two eminent ladies from razamatas theater schools uh it's dennis gosney and karen please join me in welcoming them uh thank you very much uh, eminent panelists for joining us and i'm sure we will have some time to engage the audience and take their question as well my 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 first question goes to you and uh, i would like to ask that as an institution how do you ensure that the curriculum is relevant uh the institution as a whole is competitive 
and also the institution is socially responsible while also keeping a balance with the financial interest of the institution. Very good morning to all. Well, you've asked me a question I think is the biggest challenge for any institution. If I could solve it perfectly, we would be perhaps the best institution ever. <laughs> I think this is a challenge almost any and every institution face. And I believe in their own way, every institution or organization has come up with their own best practices. See, the biggest key, how I take it as what are universities or higher ed organizations' main agenda is to meet the aspirations of the students. And the aspirations are very, very dynamic today. Say, I'll just give you an example of, say, our institution. When we set it up, we were thinking this is what the students would want. These are the kind of jobs the students would want. This is the geographical area where the jobs the students would want. Trust me, in a decade, it has drastically changed. Today, aspirations is entirely global. There is no difference between the aspiration of a student maybe sitting in Dubai, Poland, US, or even a far corner of uh, the country where we are from. So that aspiration has to be met. That is exactly the biggest point. So when you meet the aspiration, what I mean to say is the student would aspire to work perhaps in Google or Amazon or any global company, no matter where they are sitting in. So they have to be empowered with exactly the same skill set, doesn't matter where they are. So how do you bring about and uh, some kind of an equal skill set irrespective of where you are from? So that is the biggest challenge. Like when you're mentioning it has to be done with the syllabus change. Yes, that's a big challenge that every year, how do you review a syllabus to know exactly what needs to be done? Industry academy interface, it's something that has been spoken for, I don't know, years and years, but that is critical. But the biggest challenge is how do you do that? How do you get to know what the industry wants on almost a semester level, which is a big challenge because I believe the education system is not as flexible, as dynamic as corporate is. So the way corporate change, education institutes sometimes cannot keep pace with that. But one of the biggest advantage is that what university like us, uh, because we are in say a geographically little distant area, a biggest advantage, say, we have had is with the way the blended model is working. The blended model actually gives you a lot of flexibility to bring specific skill sets. You can call them micro credits. So micro credits, how they can be incorporated, actually helps to bring a lot of dynamism with the syllabus. That is a big change. Secondly, I agree that uh, what is today, the university is a temporary space where the students will only spend three to four years. But what they learn, they will be implementing in any organization. Perhaps they'll be working for 10 years or 30, 40 years of their lives. What are the biggest words today? Yes, to be uh, absolutely ready in terms of skill set, sustainability, as you mean inclusivity. These are the things they have to be understanding. So that's very difficult to have any student who are not uh, sensitive to these issues. So how do you bring the power in the campus? So you have to kind of understand that mix of students that you have in a way reflects it because they learn a lot from their colleagues, their classmates. So if that is there in the student mix, that is another thing that they will be able to implement when they go and join any organization. As I said, there is no one, I cannot give you one answer in a minute that this is exactly how to be done. There are 20 challenges in this square statement and there are 20 things that are being implemented. So I'll just try to give you the best gist that I could. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you so much. You rightly mentioned the importance of the blended learning and I think that approach is working very well. Uh, Mr. Yadav, what you do basically to enhance the learning experience of students and also to improve the teaching methods, like especially leveraging on technology. Uh, thank you, Avilasaji. So in terms of uh, student experience, now you see this in uh, this pandemic of COVID, we see everywhere in, uh, across the globe of these hardship people face across the globe. But the best side of this COVID is that adoption of technology. And this experience of technological, uh, this learning for the student is the best part which I am mentioning here. So you see the institution in India itself, the, those who are uh, not able to like uh, uh, access to online education. So now in like uh, institution like us, we have around 40% content which is going to be on. So different government, uh, this platform, so I am and other platforms, which is very relevant uh, in terms of technology, uh, technological innovation, everything is there. So we, we as an institution, we as a university always try to access to our the student best of the best in terms of LinkedIn is also providing a lot of certification and other opportunity and so such type of so many platforms are there where we have access to leverage from the technology. and. Uh, the part of the which I think was this first question which uh, Professor Avilasa was mentioning and Sussman was answer. Now India as a country is a lot changed. 
because now lot of institutions they different regulators becomes a facilitator now you might heard the name of ai school india council for technical education they adopt they have adopted a system called where they have a round the year this uh, uh, event and connected uh, this program activity which is helping student not only to learn uh, this academic things they, there are a lot of things they got opportunity to learn even in school education i have seen because we also run a school where we seen the school kids belong to like middle class right from standard 6 to 8 they have access to this uh, all this road and other tinkering lab they have a access to stem education where they can learn the concept very well so this is all what and i think uh, it's thanks to government of india for introducing policy 2020 which is helping lot so thank you mm-hmm. uh, thank you for referring to that policy and you rightly said that professional development is very important and uh, that is working very well uh dennis my next question will be for you because you come from a completely different because here is the higher education on my right side but on my left side is the school and uh, school play a prominent role especially because these are the product for the higher education coming to the skills we can notice that agility and resilience are the two key skills which are required how do you uh try to inculcate these two major skills in the curriculum of a school especially at if you can share some of the best practice in uh, uh, razamatad's theater school good morning everyone so yeah we are um, my name is denise i'm from razamatad in the uk and um, we specialize in performing arts education so we teach dance drama and singing to babies actually early years preschool right up to 18 years old and yeah performing arts education is all about confidence building character development all of that leads to resilience agility all the holistic skills that they're going to require physical development social emotional development and we strongly believe that a lot of that starts with the arts and confidence building my own story actually I'm from Scotland quite a deprived area in Glasgow in Scotland Um, I had quite low self-esteem at school. I didn't go to college. I didn't go to university. I didn't take that route. But I'm sat here today on this panel. I'm very honoured and privileged to be on this panel today, and that is the power of performing arts. It gave me the confidence to be a female founder. I've created a brand in the UK. We have 60 franchise partners in the UK. I appeared on a TV program called Dragons Den. Uh, you might not have heard of it. It's a bit like Shark Tank. I'm now an ambassador for the Prince's Trust and multi award winning in the UK. So hopefully that story speaks volumes as far as resilience. Mm-hmm. Uh Karen you are uh, in PR you are supporting the school in uh, public relation activities. So how do you think that the school is basically integrating innovation? Innovation. Um yeah so uh, the performing arts teaches um it teaches children to think differently um and with technology it needs children to be able to think outside of the box so they can utilize that technology and become creative thinkers and that's what the arts really teach children to be creative thinkers and without that it doesn't really matter what technology there is because it needs the person to be able to utilize that technology um so our children come to us from a, a range of backgrounds um but you know they all leave and they don't they not only you know have these great performing arts skills but they they come away with different life skills uh, which leads to their increased confidence which leads to them performing better at schools and then they can go on uh, and choose you know the route that they want to do through a higher education mm-hmm. uh thank you i mean uh karen has mentioned a very good point and then the question goes to you uh in any institution the students they must feel that they are welcomed they are valued uh, regardless of their race their gender their socio economic background which basically is that the institution should have some dei initiatives they should have a clear strategy in this regard so how do you ensure that 
See, the first thing I, I actually kind of mentioned this point in a very brief way. I think that, say, you spend about, say, three years, four years in your university. That university batch or whatever students that you're with would be a reflection of how you would end up in a workplace. So it has to be a good mix of having the X number of students from different backgrounds, some international students, having right kind of female candidates in every batch. These are the things because in the three years, four years, that exposure will teach you a loss. Having said that, would there be no conflict from day one? I don't think so. I agree with you. You have to understand each other. When you have a student comes in, you spend first two weeks not actually studying but learning about each other. When you learn a lot of students from other backgrounds, you actually learn that they have a different viewpoint, perhaps. So it's very important that in, say, one class of 60, you have 10 small batches made. Any student does something. Maybe we have a program where we do some kind of cultural activities. We learn about each other's culture. This is exposure. Having said that, I will still not say it's a perfect system where they still don't have problems or conflicts. They all represent different languages. So why not actually have some skits, have cultural events in different languages? So you understand, yes, you come from a different cultural background. You have a different eth ethics that you were brought up with. But, but now we are in the same class. We're going to learn maybe the similar domain knowledge and we'll go back into the industry where everyone will have a point. Maybe we are all different in some ways, but what we learn would be similar and then we'll actually end up joining a similar workforce. So these are some things that we do. Yes, there are challenges, but again, I'm saying we're trying our best to bring diversity in the classroom as much as possible. Every batch we've not succeeded, but we're trying. We have a conscious role that this is the kind of diversity we would want in each classroom. That is really teaching a lot because that three, four years of exposure, did, it does teach a lot. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Yadav, for that. Uh, uh, Sorry, Mr. Datta. Mr. Yadav, you are the chancellor. So you play a very prominent role in the institution. Uh, how, do your, how do you promote diversity, equity, and inclusion? What is the strategy of your institution? See, now diversity is a very burning issue everywhere. So India is a, one of the world's biggest uh, education system. Diversity be promoted in, in a school education, India is well known. This female is there who is the leading the show. So, in terms of diversity, we like uh, we always encourage this uh, women. Even in case of a girls student, because in technical education, girls are very less. So, on that front, we also run so many activities. We give uh, opportunity to them to lead the programs, activities, even in academic program as well. And in terms of uh, inclusivity and equity, because equ as an educator, it's our primary du duty to give opportunity to everyone. And in terms of inclusivity in India, India is a diverse country and inclusivity is a very challenging thing because a lot of things we have to need to do in uh, this in wake of the implementation of NEP. Two, three factors are very important for in Indian context. One is a uh, investment in education, which government of India is trying to put on their end. But in India, 80 percent is education is provided by private, uh, private players only. And for that, we need to have a lot of uh, use chunk of investment in education sector. Second is a finding right faculty. This is, this is a global issue and India is also facing same. But I am quite confident in terms of leadership because institution like us, we are focusing on research and development. So even in private education, you see this private educator, those come just in 30 years back. They are the top, uh, like top ranking in research publication. You see so many universities from private sector, which is publishing a lot of research publication. And I'm happy to share with you, many of you might already may know, India is, uh, now becomes a third country in the globe, which is having highest numbers of research publication. And they, those belong to SCI index, Q1, Q2 level of publication, which is one of the best standard publication in the world. Uh Thank you for that comment. While we can see that we are uh, diversity, we can see on the stage now, uh, we are having uh, three women here and two men. Uh, but I mean, Mr. Datta has mentioned something about blended learning. And you mentioned something about professional development of faculty members. Uh, you also mentioned that, yes, you encourage women to come forward. Do you have any data about your institution on this diversity? How many women leaders are there in your institution? Thank you. Uh, you will be happy to know by many times I am using Government of India initiative. So you will be happy to know now Government of India three, four years back introduced NIRF, National Institution Ranking Framework, which is giving my mileage to institutions. So in that NIRF ranking, there is a, there is a point where institutions get some numbers on the how many women leaders are there on dean position, dean student welfare, dean research. 
so many designations. So definitely we are part of that journey and we are providing our 70% leaders are women leaders in university system. Mm -hmm. That's, that's, that's wonderful to in know. In school we have around 80% of that. Okay. Uh, uh, Mr. Dutta, I have a different question for you. So, as an institution, are you adhering to uh, this because of some kind of policy requirement, some kind of ranking framework, or you think that yes, no, no, we should basically encourage diversity because diversity brings different perspective on table. There is a difference. Sometimes the institutions are only adhering because of the accreditation requirement, because of the policy framework. So what is your view on that? If I, I can only comment on our story, our founding vice chancellor was a woman. She was a doctor and she was a, because we were more towards health sciences, most of vice chancellors they initially were doctors. So she was a, uh, she was a woman leader. That is how we started. Our deans actually three were women when we started it and more or less the ratio is similar. Almost 50% are still are women. Why do we do it? I did not think we started it with the whole idea that uh, we will do it only for rankings or anything. This ranking has only come up in the last two, three years. We are like 10, 12 years old. This, whatever we've achieved now, we are almost 50% of our campus is girl students. So I don't think that has been achieved only because of the last two, three years of uh, the ranking framework putting a lot of emphasis on that. And I'll tell you a very funny reason why we have so many girl students also. We opened in one f part of the country. We're a little cut off from the larger metropolitan areas. where Most of the students go for higher education. A lot of parents want to keep the girls closer to home and are okay sending the girls, boys, wherever they want to go. So a lot of our parents have actually sent the girls to us because it's closer to home. So that's why we actually have in some uh, faculty almost 80% only girl students. So that is a thing that we did not plan or try but somehow it just happened. So that is another reason why we've been able to achieve this uh, gender diversity so easily and it, it, just, uh, it just happened. That's okay. another reason, I'll be honest with you. Okay, thank you very much for your comment. And before we jump to the sustainability uh, topic, let me ask the audience, any comments till now? Any question from anyone? Okay, with, uh, with no question, let me move to the sustainability. And uh, uh, sustainability has been, d this, this year, 2023, uh, has been declared as the year of sustainability in UAE. So UAE is, as a country, is always at a forefront to take this sustainability issue in a very serious manner. You are dealing with uh, young children. Uh, how do you ensure that this kind of sustainability issues are, is ingrained from the beginning in the early formative years? Uh, Dennis. Yeah, so with young children, they really learn through play and drama and, you know, that's how they learn. So a, a lot of the big issues that we'll talk about with them is we teach them through play and then they understand things like empathy and to put themselves into another person's viewpoint. Um, it's very hard for young children to do that, but through role play and drama games, they can learn to understand the world as a, as a, a bigger whole than, than their own small experience. Okay. Uh, so how do you ensure, uh, Mr. Yadav, that sustainability, because we want to have a very uh, secure future. That's what we want to give to our coming generation. So how, what is your institution doing in this regard? See, uh, in education, you, you have uh, like uh, uh, learning outcomes, and then this sustainability in terms of how your institution can perform consistently to achieve their goals. So on that front, uh, in terms of leadership, in terms of academic, uh, uh, academic leaders, then this learning outcomes and all other factors, so we all, I could deliberate on this and regularly be uh, keep eye on how we have to perform and then we keep also academic audit in terms of making our one of the like uh, because stakeholder is very important and to fulfill the aspiration of a stakeholder is the most important thing because education is a becomes now a service industry even though it's in, a, in India it's a like a non-profit thing but it's a becomes a very important uh, like a service industry to uh, fulfill the aspiration of the society. Absolutely. I mean, engaging uh, stakeholders is very important. Uh, Mr. Datta, how do you engage the stakeholders in ensuring sustainable practices for a sustainable future? 
first biggest stakeholder is our students and our faculty because that is the biggest uh, component in a university. Again, I've mentioned the same thing. I'm trying to get a little repetitive. I'm sorry for that. The campus will teach you something that nothing else can teach you. In our campus, we have almost 20% of our energy today comes from renewable sources. We have an entire waste management system where we are developing some kind of a local fertilizer. I don't exactly have the English word to say what's the, so that that can be given in the community. And such other three, four practices have been adopted where the students are very actively involved. We can teach there is exposure level, but at the end of the level, when they practice, they would understand that these practices can be brought forward to no matter what organization they are going to, no matter where they go in life. So these are the things that I would as a campus teach them. And this is what we are actively doing. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you teach the uh, kids, uh, Dennis or Karen, anyone who would like to uh, respond to this? Uh, how do you teach the kids to be more environmental friendly? Is there any strategy uh, through which you can teach the children to be more environmental friendly? Yeah, I mean, a lot of our schools really get involved in their local communities. So we have about 60 schools throughout the UK. And a part of their sort of strategy for their own growth as a business is to become very involved in the community. So they often get involved in, in community um, events such as litter pickups and, and various things at the community. So, that, so they will work with their local councils uh, and, and work with events that their councils are doing. And we, we make it fun for the children um, so they understand that they're you know, really putting something back into their community, um, but doing a fun activity. And then we can do sort of drama games and, and songs about it. So the, the whole thing is, is, is a fun thing for them. We also do things like going to local supermarkets and helping people to pack their bags. So they're, they're putting something back into the community that's really important for us. Mm -hmm. uh, rightly said that I think you will focus more on the problem-based learning yeah. and giving back to the community. Uh, any, uh, if, you, if I would like to ask uh, uh, Ms., uh, Mr. Datta, <coughs> key takeaways for the audience here in just last, let us say, 30 seconds. Key takeaways, I think any higher education institute will only survive as long as we're meeting the aspirations of the students. The day we don't, we will perish. The biggest challenge any one of us has, the aspirations are changing at a speed that we cannot even predict. No matter what we say, we all institutions have a mission, vision that this is what we'll do, this is what we'll start. Plus me, when the students come into the class, they have gone beyond that. So to keep track of that is the biggest challenge in a leadership role that we have. And without that, I don't think five years down the line we will even exist. So that is something we have to, and as you mentioned, the words of inclusivity, sustainability is the world, what the world is facing. If the, what the world is facing, the students learn at the campus is what they will be able to take forward as they go ahead in their life. Mm -hmm. Us as leadership roles need to keep track of that, and I would admit here it's one of the hardest roles, keeping track of that aspiration. Mm -hmm. Thank you. As leader, some key takeaways for the audience. So my, uh, uh, my focus will be like, uh, because now education becomes a global thing. And we always even tell our student to like, you are a global student. And on that front, we have to uh, like adopt best practices across the country without any boundary limitation. And as the sustainable goal you have told, so now in India itself, we are focusing on different uh, sustainable development goal. We are focusing the student and even research is going on because now, I, I was mentioning about the ranking, because Times ranking itself give a bi biggest weightage on these uh, sustainable things. So on research, uh, each institution is adop adopting three to four like research uh, sustainable goals where they focus on the research in that particular area. So I think we have to be very open-minded on the, in terms of the best practices, which country is doing what be best practice, how we can adopt it, how we can collaborate it. Because now a lot of institution across the globe is doing MOU with the, like different institution in India itself. We have uh, in last three uh, last three months we have done around uh, five MOUs with different uh, uh, continent uh, universities, prominent universities to work together. So mm -hmm. this is what whole story is running. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, rightly said, by the way, about the ranking, whether you talk about uh, Shanghai or Times Higher Education or you talk about QS, uh, we can see that sustainability is one of the key indicators now with a lot of weightage there. And that's the reason that education sector, especially the higher education, is focusing a lot on that now. Uh, as we come to the end of this session, I would like all of you to just take a moment 
and reflect on the importance of redefining leadership, uh, especially in the era of globalization. The leadership is not limited to the chancellors, to the vice president, or, or uh, to the board of trustees, or to the managing director. It is for all of us. We all are leaders in some sense. We have discussed three key areas, which is basically tech intervention, inclusivity, and sustainability. And we know that while tech has transformed our life, uh, we have to embrace technology. We cannot survive without that. And inclusivity is very essential to ensure that everyone feels welcome and they feel valued in their respective institution, regardless of age, gender, or their socioeconomic status. It is also very important for all of us to ensure that we promote environmental sustainability, environmental responsibility, so that our future is secure. I urge all of you to take uh, the lessons learned from this session and discuss them and apply them in your respective institution. And on this note, I thank you for the lovely audience for hearing to us. And thank you to each one of the panelists here. Thank you very much.